What is up, YouTube? It's your boy Agostino, and what's up, podcast listeners? It's your boy also, D. Agostino. Welcome to episode number seventy-seven of the Agostino Zinger Show. <sighs> How the fucking hell are ya? Huh? Hope you're well, man. You good? Great, great. It's fucking amazing, man. Today is what Tuesday morning sometime. Um, I just came back from the gym, so I'm a little bit uh sticky. You know, you know you. You know when you come up in the gym and you don't rest enough and then you jump straight into the shower and then from the shower you just start moisturising straight away and you've kind of got this weird little kind of stickiness to your body. So that's why I feel. I feel kind of sticky. So uh, please excuse the perspiration that might be coming off the screen or seeping through your headphones. Either way, I'm going to get this done, man. How are you guys, man? Good? Woo! What a hell of a weekend has been for the one A G O S T I N H O. I couldn't be a rapper, could I? Because that's way too long, right? It's the A, the G, the O, the S, the T, the I, the N, the H, the O. That's fucking... That's, that might as well be a minute long, isn't it? Spelling out your name. Um, probably not the best way. Maybe you need to abbreviate it some way, but I hate abbreviations. Anyways, that aside, wow. What a what an interesting weekend and one interesting beginning of the week and an interesting month in general, right? Just everything encapsulated into one. So, um, I think... Basically, first off, it might be best to start off with uh, saying R.I.P. with X. As I'm sure a few of you know, um, or some that don't know, um, XXX Tentacion, a well-known SoundCloud rapper who kind of rose to prominence in the last two or three years due to antics and good music, antics and good music, has been killed yesterday night. Oh, yesterday morning, it appears, in Miami. He was shot in a drive-by shooting. Um, unfortunately, he was taken to hospital to try and resuscitate him, but he was pronounced dead um, on arrival, essentially. Um, yeah, man, it's really, really gutting news. Um, I've long been a fan of his music. Um, I think I've mentioned a few times before during the whole Kanye West stuff when everyone was freaking out that he was a fan of Trump and stuff. I'm, I'm able to separate the artist and the actions of the person quite easily. Um, and usually I don't really care about what they do outside of their work that they produce or they put out there because I just think, I don't know, I think us regular pedestrians or the general public have, we probably, probably hold the celebrities up to the, or well-known people, influential people, we probably hold her up to a higher standard than we do to our own friends, you know? It's a little bit um, disingenuous to us to assume that you've only heard of fucked up shit when it comes to celebrities, which is really ridiculous, isn't it? Like, you've only heard you don't have an uncle in your family or an auntie who says wild shit like Kanye. Or not to that extent, but like, you know, who's very uh, careless in what they say. You don't have um, a person who's maybe erratic and who has suffered from being incarcerated for such a, such a young age, growing up in a very turbulent family. If you don't know people like that, in and around your circle or you've not heard those stories and i think you're being a bit disingenuous and probably lying in that respect so i don't really give that much of a shit about what they do outside of um their work but um when it comes solely to the music x i always thought was one of the most talented kids to come out of that whole soundcloud rapper generation i think from the very beginning it, it was very evident that xx Tentacion, lil uzi vert and playboy carty were the standout um talents within that group of of artists because they had um they just had a they just had a they just had a more polished and forward thinking approach of making music you know Lil Uzi Vert's early mixtapes you could tell he was going to be a star right he just had really good songs really good anthems um the the subject matter of these songs was very introspective he touched on loads of things such as depression breakup uh, family strife like he was kept amazing flexing songs don't get me wrong too but they just had so many layers to them play playboy carty also someone that has been very meticulous in the way that he presents his image he doesn't post that much on social media he's very mysterious he doesn't drop singles for the most part um maybe a few looses here or there most of everything is on a project he predominantly works with one producer in pierre Bourne. and x had the similar sort of um idea when it came to putting out music you know he kind of always packaged stuff in uh, in an album his breakout song uh that got him really famous he didn't repeat that formula again you know when he put when he put out his album he always tried to switch things up again he always made really interesting videos he gave very interesting interviews but then i guess from the general public's point of view he probably let himself down a bit because of his actions outside of music you know when it comes to the allegation of him maybe abusing his ex-girlfriends the, the story that he he said on no jumper where he uh, beat a gay guy nearly close to death in the showers and shit. 
Like it's got some really fucked up stuff, you know. The fact that um, Rob Stone was it Rob Stone or one of those guys, Rob Banks or Russell, one of those one of those Rob's um, associates came up and snuffed him on the stage. Um, he's been involved in countless fights with fans, like just a whole litany of like, um, you know, like anger and rage, you know, like just just seeping out of his bones. But then when you hear his story, you hear how fucked up his childhood has been. You hear how. He was, you know, in and out of de detention centers from when he was young. This story was only really going to end one way, you know? Like, even though he did, pending the trial, I'm assuming mostly because of the trial, he did kind of um, pull himself away from the spotlight, you know? He kind of uh, kept himself isolated, stayed in Miami for the most part, didn't really hang out in LA. Um, he did make it a habit to check in with loads of people randomly. A lot of people are posting screenshots of their texts with him or voice or, or video chats and stuff. So he was trying to turn a corner. There's a video of him uh, just before he gets shot where he's using uplifting messages. He's saying like an uplifting message to his fans and telling them that if he dies, he hopes his music can live on to kind of influence people. I wouldn't read too much into that. I think people are saying it's a prophecy, but I wouldn't read too much into it because this generation of artists have a tendency to always... Uh, fantasize about death i guess there's this weird kind of uh a law of like um dying as a living legend you know the whole like kurt cobain thing right um never really f act never fully realizing your potential but also living enough work behind that people will immortalize you as one of the greatest ever like uh similar to like, what happened to little peep right um another very talented artist who kind of obviously overdosed on drugs but you know he left behind so much material that people are able to kind of maybe look at the current landscape and maybe assert that he was probably one of the best to ever do it within that age group but regardless it's a sad situation um i hope lessons can be learned from it from the other generation from the other kids who are kind of coming up as well number one just i don't know if people believe in that sort of thing but the karmic value of just like you know that kind of energy you put out like consistently being on the front foot and attracting just aggression and violence and shit and added to that the idea that for the most part when you come up in an industry where it's kind of rewards people that come up with a kind of diy ethic you know and it kind of rewards you um exponentially right you go from being you go from sleeping on your friend's couch to owning a mansion right there's no in between when it comes to the music industry it seems like right um even though even if it even if the mansion's an airbnb the cars at least doesn't matter like from perception based right from the people that are around you your peers it seems like you go from zero to 100 so with that included you know and the fact that jealousy can um, arise from those kind of things envy can arise from those things added to the fact that you're uh purposely antagonizing people you are shitting on them um you are i don't know you're it's you're illustrating maybe a lack of respect or a lack of care for your own life and those around you right uh, about always like, fantasizing about death and all that kind of shit that maybe you know the karmic value of that thing even if you do do what x did in the last six months or so and you do kind of pull away and isolate yourself there's maybe a theory that you just can't avoid that kind of karmic value coming back to you one way or the other now that's not to say that he deserves to die no one's saying that that's horrible you know no one deserves to go out like that especially watching the video is so di so distressing man seeing him just slumped in a chair alone no friends around him you know, like, considering how impactful his music has been, how many people has touched around the world, like, just to die like that in the middle of the street with not, none of your friends around you and just, you know, it's just, it's horrible. But I also hope that the kids coming up now um, can maybe heed that as a warning of, like, you know, just just stay on your grind, man. Make music, you know, create art. Um, try and be the best person you can be to your family, to your friends, to your close ones. Uh to your fans even and just go from there man because it's not it's just not worth it why would you with all that talent in the world it's just so sad to have some that much of a level of talent and not be able to actualize it you know and not be able to like fulfill your your ultimate potential and that's probably the, the saddest thing about this whole story man just fucking hell man like the guy has so much more to give you see that question mark album that came out recently on that was really good everyone was raving about it uh, the songwriting was incredible. The beats were really good. Um, it's just such an interesting character, you know, like so troubled and flawed, but just so talented as well. And in one respect, just you can't help but feel bummed about it, really. So I don't know. I'm just bummed out, man. I'm really bummed out. I was a big fan of his music. I follow, I've been following him from the very beginning, to be honest. And it's just really sad, man. And I hope his memory can live on and people can 
heed a lesson from it, at least for the most part, and maybe take something away from it. Yeah, and hopefully we don't lose any more, man. This year has been fucking nuts already, you know what I mean? Um, or oh, this is month in general, you know? Jesus Christ. But yeah, so RIPX, um, thoughts and prayers go out to all these family and friends and close ones and shit. And yeah, hope his memory lives on, man. Let that music reign free. Um, uh, what else next? Uh, yeah, I've had a bit of a busy weekend. Um, busy being an understatement. Uh dj uh back to back on friday and saturday um at the tap at tap east which is usually a little bit of a calm affair you know it's not as busy as it as most stratford bars should be it kind of gets quiet about nine ish whatever but this time around it was completely different because it happened to be the same weekend that um the jay-z and beyonce concert was on at stratford arena so it was absolutely ram jammer like packed to the rafters and um yeah an insane event I had to play like five or no, six hours, right? Um, for most nights, or for both, no, for both nights, I think, five to six hours, I played a DJ set. And yeah, man, like, I'm obviously comfortable playing a longer set, right? I think that's probably something I've been able to do consistently for a long time. So I've kind of honed that craft. But there probably is a gap in the idea of me having time to play a peak hour set, right? I still have a gap there because I haven't, you know how if you go to Dawson or you go to Shoreditch or you go to parts in Southeast London, there are people there who, most DJs play for like an hour, an hour and a half, right? So they come on and just start with the bangers. So they're able to like play a really good peak hour set. That's the only thing that I'm not very good at at the moment. I think that's the only bit I've got like a little bit of a hole in my game that needs to up. But again, that's only because I don't really play, I've never come in as like an assassin to play like an hour set. I've always played like a four to five to six hour set, which obviously, you know, I'm not complaining about, but I just need to even, I just need to maybe make sure that even in that four or five hour set that I do, that I try and fit in a kind of a peak hour set and kind of get that going. I kind of did achieve that on a Saturday, but wow. Number one, lessons to be learned from that weekend. Um, DJing sober, right, in a bar full of drunk girls is very overrated. The reason why I'd say that is because when you're sober, you forget how drunk people um, don't know how to judge distance, right? There's no uh, there's no personal space when you're drunk because the whole idea is that you're ma you're merry, you know, you're jolly, you're having a good time, and you're very tactile, right? You're touchy feely. Um, you get very close to speak and shit, and there's a tendency as well to kind of always lean in and speak. Um, really loudly right which I, I never got right if you're gonna lean in just speak in a normal tone you're already close to me and i can hear you um and maybe because they think the music's too loud i don't know whatever it is so that's annoying and you know another thing i've noticed too um having been djing in a bar that's that doesn't turn the lights off right you see everything so i'm looking up right and there's a tendency that i think i probably did which i i'm conscious now i'm trying to avoid when you're out in a bar and you're talking, especially talking to a girl, a random person, right? It tends you to always like hold them by the waist or have your back, your arm, your hand towards the back of their way. I don't know what it is. It's not, is it a flirting thing? Is it like a, is it like a instinctual thing? Like you want to take care of them and make sure they don't do anything silly or they don't fall over and stuff. But it's really creepy, I think. Like why do they need to hold them on the waist? And there's a weird acknowledgement that they know your hand's there too, but they don't mind that they, they they allow you to put your hand there. It's like a constant, like you see it happening quite a lot. Like they'll, they'll be talking, they'll lean in, hand there, lean away, the hand will come down, lean in, the hand will go in again. It's like a constant, it's just weird, man. So I was making a, a, I was making a real concerted effort to just like, just move my head towards the person and say, what, what do you say? You know, that kind of helped. Um, but it was a funny night in general, the both weekends, uh, having to play, um, a mostly R&B hip hop set, which I don't really do. Um, I tend to stray away from it just because everyone DJs like that, especially in East London. Like it's just a standard go-to thing, you know, playing gram garage and hip hop and R&B. And there's always a tendency to always play old things. You know, no one's, everyone's kind of stuck in the nineties, which is really annoying. Um, and in general, I think there's people out there who do a much better job at playing that kind of music than I would ever do. Right. Um, because that's what they do week in, week out. Same thing. I mean, like I think, I'm probably one of the best people to play a four hour set around, right? I, I think I'm, I'm up there, right? Because I do it every every month or every other week. Um, same goes to, same can be said for people that play hip hop and R&B. So I try to avoid that and make sh and kind of carve my own lane by playing disco house and all that sort of uh, malarkey. But it was quite fun, you know, playing hip hop and R&B. It's quite fun to play stuff that everyone recognizes and they're looking forward to. But the other thing you realize, you have to play so much music within an hour to get through an hour set. 
because the tracks are like two and a half, I mean, three minutes to four and a half minutes long. But then it, you don't really hear the whole thing, right? You might, you might, you might want to cut off a, uh, a Duo Santana um, verse, right, before it comes on. You might want to cut it after the first chorus um, and mix something else in because you get bored. Um, it's really, yeah, it's it's weird, man. You have, you, got, you have to play a lot of songs, a lot of songs in a hip hop and R and B set to get for an hour. That's something I did not enjoy for the most part but i did enjoy playing the songs in general i think they were fun hearing those things out again um and obviously like as per, as per usual i made sure to make a playlist before i left which made the, the job so much easier too um thank god for making plays i don't know how i live my life even beforehand even not playing even though i brought my controller with me because the, the bar we playing doesn't have cdjs or whatever um i still made the effort to make big and prepare a playlist just because you know you don't want to be on your laptop staring at the screen typing and stuff it just still was annoying so i just had a i just had the my laptop kind of the screen sort of like lowered and i'll just select a song put it on and just you know keep it moving sort of thing had it in my list and select it from the list and blah 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 so you know i'm not always staring and kind of typing in words or typing in song names that i want to bring up and usually whenever you're on a spot like that and you're having to play a set you kind of always miss you kind of always forget stuff you want to play anyway so having the Having at least most of the things I want to play in the playlist, can you can at least allow you to bounce off ideas. And then when someone requests something, you're like, oh yeah, shit, I forgot about that. Da, 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 da. But for the most part, requests are kind of bullshit too, which is interesting. Um, in there, I had a girl come up to me asking me for Beyonce while Beyonce was actually playing, which was in, which was a funny moment. Um, and I was like, oh, it's actually this is Beyonce. She said, no, 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 but you know, like real Beyonce. It's like, what's real Beyonce? This is Beyonce. <laughs> it's like, Jesus Christ. Um. I don't think I've ever in my whole entire life, right, um, asked a DJ for a request. This is even before I used to DJ. I don't think ever in my entire life have I had the courage or the gumption to think that I knew better, right? That I I had a good suggestion that would really set the party off on fire. It's like, and usually whenever they ask you the request, right, it's never anything you're playing. So it's not like in the general theme of like, oh yeah, if you're playing that, right, it's like this. Like, no, no, no. Let me take that back. There's been a couple of times a few older gentlemen, a few older dads have like asked me for songs that have been in the vein of what I'm playing already, right? So if, you're, if I'm playing something about a clash, they'll play, they'll they'll at least reference something that's in the same era or something within that same ballpark of a genre. But for the most part, I'm I'm playing a song that has nothing. To, I'm playing a song and I request something that has nothing to do with that song whatsoever. Like how like think about it. If you're a DJ or think just think about it, how is that meant to come on? It doesn't fit. Oh, no, no, just play it now, just play it now. No, I'll play it later. No, play it now. It's like, how can I play it now? I'm playing fucking Diana Ross and you want future. How does that make sense? Like, anyway. Weird, weird occasion. But in general, it was a good it was a good moment. Um, Enjoyable to, to do that. Plus, I was working all the, over the weekend too, so I had to balance those two things, which was interesting. Um, Not as hard as I thought it would be again. Um, And yeah, just in general, it's a decent lifestyle, man, I think. Having to, you know... I would be, I'd, I'd be more than happy to play two to three days a week. I think, and maybe that'll be my max, right? If I, if I was able to like balance it and do that every week, I think I'd be ha- more happy to do that, like a proper residency, like um, maybe do like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? I'd be happy, more than happy to do. That. I think that'd be great, like do that week, week after week, or maybe even twice a week. That'd be sick. Um, and yeah, it's really enjoyable. I really, really enjoy it. I think I'm getting better at every time. I'm getting a lot better at communicating with the crowd too, you know, making sure I make eye contact and not just staring at my screen all the time or the CDJs, having a bit of a dance behind it, being a bit of a performer, you know, putting on a bit of a show, being a bit of a showman. Um, I'm, I uh, idolize guys like DJ Harvey and Ricardo Villalobos who, you know, no DJ set is ever boring. You know, they're always trying to put a show on, always trying to entertain the fans and, or not the fans, that's fucking gay. No one's coming to see me, but, you know, like entertain whoever's there in the, in the place because usually if you're in a bar, and your friend goes to the toilet. You don't want to be staring at your phone. You know, you might want to just stare at the DJ for a little bit. And I'm, and I'm there. I don't know. You can stare at me whilst I shuffle and move my shoulders around. Left, right, left, right, left, 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 right, 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 left. It's always a bit of enjoyable. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was great, man. I, I enjoyed it. I can't wait to do it again. Be DJing. What am I doing? Oh, DJing again in the Heathcote Star on the 23rd, 24th, 23rd, one of them. Check my website, tinozinga.com for more. There'll be a flyer on there. With all the date, with the dates and that and shit on there, I'll keep updating other dates that I get. But overall, I find a very, very enjoyable man. Very, very enjoyable. Um, that lifestyle is pretty decent, man. You know, pretty decent lifestyle. Um, gonna gonna keep doing it again, balancing uh working and stuff and doing my other things in general, 
and keeping up with the podcast, doing the DJing, blah, 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 and just see what pops off, you know, what kind of um, allows me to fly the nest and do my own thing first. But I think that kind of approach, you know, being professional about the DJing thing, turning up on time, preparing a playlist, uh, having all my equipment there with me, um, has kind of lended itself to other avenues that I'm doing now, like such as reading my book, such as the podcasting stuff that I'm doing, uh, even the learning language and stuff that I'm starting to pick up a little bit more. You know, being um, having a professional outlook on one thing usually impacts the other stuff. So that's been encouraging to see. So hopefully that long may that continue in short. And that's been, yeah, it's been an interesting time overall. And that's been about it, really. Then what, what else have I got coming up? No holidays, no festivals. Thinking of going to, I was thinking of going to Wireless Festival, right? Um, predominantly to see Playboy Carti because he played recently at this Adidas part at, at this Adidas event for the World Cup. Um, in the sh there's like a little Shoreditch pop up shop that they've put up, and um, I got sent the link really late. Annoyingly, it was on Dice, so I had to fucking download the fucking Dice app and all that bullshit, right? Um, I downloaded the Dice app, got a ticket, but then I finished work quite late. Um, managed to get out about 8.20, the earliest I could get out. And thought, you know what, it's it's not really on my way home, but I can easily take a bit of a detour to go there before I go to the station. I decided to kind of walk by and see what the, the vibe was saying, and it was absolutely rammed. Like, there was, a, there was a queue that stretched a long, long, long way. And, you know, generally, you know, generally, if you've ever been to those kind of events, you know what the vibe is, you know what the situation is. So I was walking past the queue. I saw the queue, the general public queue, for the most part, I was really long. Then I saw the queue that obviously was a VIP queue that was really long too. And then there was another tiny queue on the other side of the door that was like the people who considered themselves above VIP who had kind of friends that worked inside the shop, right? They were sending text messages and doing the whole phone call thing. So I was just like, nah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I love Paper Kai, but I don't love him enough to be like outside begging people to let me into like a pop-up shop. That's not really my vibe. But yeah, so I kind of allowed it and kept it moving, but... I really want to see Playboy Carti on the, I think the Sunday of Wireless Festival. Uh, I think Lil Uzi Vert's also playing on that Sunday too. Let me just double check actually. I think Lil Uzi Vert's playing on that Sunday as well. I really want to check it out. But there's there's tickets on SeatWave, right? Or this kind of resale website that does that sells tickets. And it's like £170 for one day. It's a bit much, isn't it, right? Right? Do you agree? It's a bit much. And I know for sure if I, I'm going to be the kind of person, I buy the ticket and then, uh, and then it kind of comes out that he's kind of, he's performing in a, I don't know, the Brixton Academy or something, right? So hopefully, it, I'm going to show it on the screen now. Hopefully you see it. So this this is the this is the listings, right? So Sunday, you've got Khalid, Giggs, uh, Ray Schmurder, Lil Uzi Vert, Rick Ross, Russ, no one wants to see him, Playboy Carti, uh, Lil Pump, Mist, uh, notes, Trippy Red, Ski Master, Slump God, Six Seven, Smoke Perp, uh, J.K. Suspect, Lisa Mercedes, Semtex, and Manny Nort, the DJ guy, right? And Places and Faces Sounds too. So those those guys are playing as well. So I don't know, man. Shit. What do you think? Should I pay one hundred seventy pound to go and see Lil Uzi Vert? I mean, Playboy Carti play. <sighs> Because I'm really, really enjoying that album, man. I'm super really enjoying the album. I think the album's uh, Dialect is probably one of my favourite albums to come out this year. Um, it's just a really good, put, well put together project. I love the punk vibe of it. I love the voice inflections that he does when he picks up his voice. Um, I love the kind of monotonous chanting uh, choruses, you know. Like, it's just, just fucking so solid. The features are amazing too. So I'm, I'm not, I don't know. Whether or not it's worth paying that much to go see him live for one day. I'm pretty sure on Seatwave it said it said that, right? Seatwave. Let me check Seatwave for Wireless Festival. I'm pretty sure it said Sunday 170. But or maybe I might chill until the last minute before just before the the tickets go up, right? Maybe someone might sell it really cheap online and I'll be happy to pay. But I'm pretty sure last time I checked, if I I'll show you guys on here. Last time I checked, I'm pretty sure it said Sunday was 170, right? So let's see here. Where's the Sunday? Sunday day ticket. There we go. Saturday, Sunday. 100 and 111 left, right? Let's see here. Oh, 135. So it's going down, right? It was 170 before, right? 
It's going to 130. I think, right? I think I'd pay. I happy. I'd be happy to pay 100 pounds. I'd pay 100. I'd pay 100 quid to see him play. 100, 100 percent. I'd pay 100 quid. Cause 100 quid, I get Playboy Carti, Lil Uzi Vert, um, Trippy Red. But there's a problem. I, I, I'm not gonna see them all. At, how many stages are at, at Wireless? Have they got the stages on there? How much have they have? If they've got more more stages, if they've got more than, I don't know how many stages there are actually at Wireless. And if there's gonna, if, there's definitely gonna be a conflict of, um. There's definitely gonna be a clash, right? I'm pretty sure there'll be a clash. But I wanna see what the stages are looking like. Info. Do they have any stages? Why are they do it so late too, by the way? They don't they don't put a stage information until A to a long, long, long time. Um those open the music will start there and there'll be a strict curfew at ten thirty. Where to stay, age restrictions. Nothing about the stages, is there, really at the moment? Which is annoying. Event info. Nothing about stages? Okay. Wireless. Wireless Festival 2018 stage time, right? It's in July. It's coming up in a month. Why didn't just put all the stage times out? It's really, really weird, isn't it? I guess they put it out just before the event starts. I don't know. Maybe, maybe to avoid any last minute um, just, just to cover themselves for last minute dropouts maybe i don't know what's happening yeah i guess not yeah i guess there's no i guess there's no um stage times on there which is a bit annoying um it's weird how they do it so late isn't it I, what premier F sound festival had their stage times out like a few weeks before the event actually started, I don't know what's with these UK festivals not putting the times up. But again, maybe I'm maybe it's because it's gonna just in case it kind of flops or someone doesn't turn up, right? You can protect your back and make sure nothing shit happens. I don't know, weird, 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 weird. But yeah, um, hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, I can get that done. But I would happily pay hundred quid. How much would you pay to see someone that you like at a festival? Hmm. Because you have to consider, right? It's a festival, right? So you've got a lot of people playing on one day or you've got a lot of people playing on another day. Um, or if you actually, let me see what the tickets are for the two days. Maybe it's about 2.10, right? I'm assuming. Are people doing 2.10? Um, let's see. For like the Saturday, Sunday. Because maybe that could be an option too, right? You go on, you just go on birthdays and just do the damn job. Maybe, is it going to be 2.10? 2.30, I was saying? 2.30, right? For two days is fucking nuts, right? But I'll pay a hundred quid for 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 one day. Hundred percent, I pay hundred quid. I'm I'll pay max two hundred quid for the two days. Max two hundred. And even that is a lot of money. Like I paid hundred and eighty six pounds for Primavera Sound Festival in Barcelona too. You know, five day a five day festival essentially. People only go for the three or the two days, but five day festival. Like I happily paid that much. So imagine. Yeah, annoying, annoying, annoying. But hey, I guess we're gonna we'll, we'll get it done and we'll get it sorted one way or the other. But yeah, that was the only thing that I, I kind of am looking forward to. Maybe the end of the month. Um, there's Love Box Two with a little nerd playing on the Saturday, which I'm I bought a ticket already to, which I'm gonna go to, which I can't wait. That should be really fun. And apart from that, yeah, man, just taking it easy and relaxing. You know, making sure I'm I'm trying to get this year ended on the right way so we're kind of already on hot we're at the halfway point right of the year um i've kind of stuck to the things i wanted to do you know i'm making sure i make this podcast every week doing i'm djing at least once a month uh working out a lot trying to read a lot you know trying to expand my brain put something out there you know um sell some products make a little business you know on the side do things in general so we can achieve my dreams achieve my dreams so yeah, that's that's the main that's the main part of the things that are going on. Um, what notes? I've, I've actually got some things on this docket that I wanted to talk about before I head off. What were they? Yeah. So what have we got here? So um, topic number topic uh, number uno, right? We have here social media killing us slowly. Um, this interesting article popped up in my feed, right? that I want to talk about from the business of fashion. Hopefully you guys can see it. Um, it's by a young lady.
by the name of Emma Hope Alwood, right? Um, it's a very interesting article talking about the perils of social media. It feels as if every other, it feels as if every other week or every other day, there's been a weird. I, I, I've noticed it in my on my feed too. A lot of people are speaking about how social media is killing us, right? Um, this idea that everyone's on their phones, no one's really living in the present moment. This idea that um, Facebook, Instagram, all these other social media platforms have a way of making sure they loop us or they keep us, or they kind of draw us back into their app so we're not um, communicating with our friends, we're not living in the moment. People are getting depressed because they're looking at people they look up to, they're their idols and they're thinking their life ain't shit because you know they seem like they're having all the fun and you're not doing anything with your own life blah 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 blah. right i have a different take on the situation because i've had a a bit of a weird relationship when it comes to social media right i've been on most social media platforms since their inception uh, i was on facebook when it first came out in the first couple of years when it used to be just for the universities only because i was going to a university at the time and i read about it in the and actually in the sunday times um funnily enough that i used to buy every week um back in those days when i cared about the news um i started instagram when it first came out i was on tumblr when it first came out blogger when it first came out twitter when it first came out like a lot of the platforms i've kind of always jumped on and just you know i've, I've always prescribed to the idea of like instead of criticizing from the rafters i'd rather use the app um you know get my hands on it and then see if it's good or bad right and then kind of make my opinion on that regard so I've kind of always, I've given everything on the go. I've not stuck with some things like Snapchat. I gave that a go when it first came out. I just didn't really get it. Um, I didn't necessarily care about people's lives on video that much. I didn't really care about making my own content on video as much as I did, um, as much as I did at that time, right? Um, now I do it quite a lot on Instagram stories. I use the videos option on that quite often or upload pictures and shit, but I wasn't really fond of it on Snapchat. So there are things that I've used that I haven't really been a fan of, but in general, I've always been able to kind of distance myself and not live entirely on it. I'm probably more addicted to the internet than I am to social media apps or the platforms themselves, right? So I probably spend an absorbent, um, exorbitant, exorbitant, or whatever that word is, right? Amount of time on the internet as opposed to social media. That's like reading articles, browsing stuff, watching a video. Uh, I don't know, whatever. I'm always reading articles, looking at stuff, like just in general, right? But I've also know that these apps have been one of the most important, most of the most important life changing things that I've had in my life in a long time. Right? They've allowed me to start a blog. They've allowed me to start a YouTube channel, to tweet stuff, to um, to maybe even contact clubs that I want to play at, to DJ, to put on parties, to play football, to meet people up at on a holiday when you're on your own and you don't know who to hang out with. Um, use apps like Meetup.com and stuff like the internet and social media in general has been has been nothing but positive to me in that regard but i do respect that they might be a bit of a um, you might come some get a little bit ott with it right you might get a little bit crazy but i also know it's a tool right in my experience i think it's a tool that you use but you don't let it use you so adam at the, so there's i've had this thing lately which i do quite often i never really take avenue else's well instagram stories for the most part i might check like two or three if they happen to be there like on the you know when you put up your story there happens to be free on there or something accidentally if i'm watching someone's video it might not it might just slip in somebody else's but i don't necessarily watch people's feeds that much i have a feed blocker on my facebook uh profile on my uh, macbook on my chrome browser i don't have one on my phone but when i'm so i don't have the facebook app on my phone but i sometimes log in through the web browser on safari so the only time i might see a feed is if i'm on there but it's very rare um i don't really look through my instagram feed that much e either i don't i usually just check my discovery page because i like loads of like fitness and the standard shit right um trainers and all that sort of shit start stuff so i might find something interesting on there on my feed um in general, I kind of have a bit of an arm's length distance with them. I'm able to kind of just use it and just lock off my phone. So I'll upload stuff and just like not check it again for like the whole day and check it when I come back. Right? I'm not really bothered about who's liking stuff, who's, who's leaving a comment. Even though I, if someone leaves a comment, I always reply and stuff. Like I always respond back to my messages and shit. But I don't necessarily like, oh, this only got 25. I'm going to take it down and re-upload something else. I don't really care that much about that sort of stuff. I just upload my content when I want to and then just kind of keep it moving. But I do appreciate some people are not able to do that, especially if you have a job that requires you to use social media as a way to promote your personal brand in the case of this girl called emma hope alwood who writes this article in business for fashion which is 
pretty sad. It's a pretty bleak story, but it's quite interesting too to kind of get the other side of the perspective of it, right? Because I'm I'm able to manage it, but it seems that she's not able to manage it on her regard. So I'll kind of read a little, a little ex- excerpt of the story so you guys can follow along, and I'll probably I have it up on the screen as well here. Is it on there? Yep, stop showing it now. So here we go. Emma, Emma Hope Alwood for Business of Fashion. So she writes, A weird thing happened to me recently. I was daydreaming about hanging out with someone I'd met, someone I'd liked, when I suddenly had a realisation. I was just imagining us together. I wasn't just imagining us together. I was imagining how we'd look together if another person was watching footage of us on Instagram stories. The extent to which social media and the exhibitionism and voyeurism upon which it depends had embedded itself into my unconscious fantasies shocked me. But really, it shouldn't have. The fact is, to be hyper-connected, millennial today, is to exist in multiple realities, to both be present within and outside of your own experiences, living them while simultaneously observing them and assessing their shareability. All of us as publishers, all of us are publishers, seeking opportunities for storytelling, producing daily content to the point that we're almost convinced our Instagram feeds are a truer representation of ourselves than who we are in real life. That's a bit weird, right? Because not really, like... I upload what two or three times uh, sometimes uh, here or maybe three to five times a week maybe if that right it's not a reflection of who I am as a person if anything it's just like something I've seen online that I thought was interesting uh we bulldoze the walls between public and private edited out the messiness embraced the self-regarding gaze of constant surveillance how many likes would this get am I funny enough hot enough never thought that in my life um does this look too edited or too real don't care Every Instagram post is a case study of how much people like us. And while millennials joke about our personal brands, the neat, saleable version of ourselves, the digital super storefronts, uh, shopfronts, sorry, advertising our personal U- uh, USPs, they're ultimately how we communicate to the world and increasingly how we make sense of our own identities to ourselves. Mine, came, mine can be summed up like this. Lots of black, slicked hair, Margiela tabby boots, a Prada uh, backpack, Lurid 1970 horror film, Cindy Sherman. Give me a series of things and I'll tell you instantly whether they're on brand for me. Ka- uh, Kathy Acker equals yes. Charles Bukowski, no. Sphinx Cats, yes. Spaniels, no. Yeah, but that's maybe your own fault really, isn't it? Like allowing yourself to be um, surmised by those objects those personal possessions is maybe says more about yourself as it does a social media platform really doesn't it um i've never really been a fan of edited social media i've never really been a fan of edited social like i guess now instagram is kind of especially the main your, your main instagram profile not your um finstagram right the kind of the fun part of it but i imagine your main one especially if you're a personal if you're like an influencer maybe that's maybe that's kind of like your portfolio, right? You kind of show your best of. And then your fence is where you upload all the kind of random shit you don't want anyone to see. I kind of get that. But then on the other hand, meh. You know? Meh. It's like, just change it around. I don't know. Like, show more of your life, you know? Communicate a little bit. Be a bit more real, you know? This polished idea of like, just showing your all black outfits and your bald cat and your tabby boots maybe that's maybe that is just you then maybe that is just you maybe you are that person you are those possessions if you are embrace it but i think there is probably a little bit more to you emma hope alwood um and here we go uh she continues my professional life as a digital head of uh, head of fashion for days offers up countless opportunities to project a glamorous image to my followers runway shows freebie celebrity encounters part of my day-to-day role is also the manager of a successful instagram page so i understand how it all works yeah, she's too far into the weeds, isn't it, really? But yeah, this interesting article, um, I'll link it in the profile, uh, in, sorry, in the show description. You guys can read it yourself. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But essentially, she kind of got lost in the woods and kind of now is taking a bit of a sabbatical from the whole thing. And, you know, she's kind of stepped away from this whole uh, social media stuff. But I think we are kind of reaching a breaking point. We I've seen, obviously, if you guys have seen the new iOS update, there's like a, there's like a tracker that kind of shows you how much time you're spending on certain apps and you can you can basically uh you can basically schedule in the amount of time that you want to spend on social media or on internet and stuff like that and it will kind of give you a bit of a timer and tell you hey by the way you've only got 15 minutes left of social media use do you know what i mean the fyi so you can there's that part of it but i just think those things are great to track stuff and to make sure that you're not getting too lost in the weeds but you have to then fill up that that space left with other shit 
And I think that's the issue that I have with some with some of these people that are complaining about social media is that they don't want to do the hard work of finding out what they find what there's what what they want to do or what's interesting right or to find a hobby because it's very difficult to kind of get into that it kind of is a bit it's a bit too introspective in some respects right you don't want to it's it's hard i get it i can i can understand it but i think i think that's the problem i have a little bit when it comes to universal basic income i think it is an inevitable outcome right in general especially if automation um ends up going where it ends up going and ai ends up taking over there are going to be a lot of low skilled jobs even the kind of job that i'm probably doing at the moment that's gonna get phased out and those people are gonna need other jobs but the jobs won't exist so the idea is that universal basic income or ubi will allow people to live right um so you'll be paid a set salary and then you can do other things on top of that you can maybe do some vocational work volunteer your time or fill your life up with hobbies and shit right but i think people sometimes i think we underestimate the role work plays in some people's lives. Like they just have nothing else interesting going on in their life. Like work is everything for them. You, you and you've, you've, you've met these people, right? The kind of person that's um, really quick to jump into work gossip and is always starting some sort of drama at work, or always has an opinion about certain things or the kind of person who's always moaning about the place that they're working, but isn't making any effort to change. Uh, the kind of person that's had a job for the same job for five plus years, you know, like, just that loves having a job usually there's no you don't really have anything else in your life outside of that now that can be due to your own uh lack of introspection right you're not really looking within yourself to find out things that you do like that also can be you just kind of getting conditioned to be that way because you've had a job and you've just been comfortable receiving a paycheck end of the month but i think there needs to be a concerned effort uh to understand that social media is a tool right uh don't let it overtake you or, or don't let it use you 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 use it for the better because i think instagram facebook youtube they're they're amazing platforms to kind of get your voice out there right uh to kind of make yourself an authority in a certain subject to kind of uh participate in current culture you know whether it be a commentator or a critique or even creating your own thing whatever it may be right i think taking part or actively putting your face out there and saying hey here's why here's who i am here's what i have to say um and not being an anonymous comment somewhere underneath a blog post that's super essential but i also think there has to be an idea that as much as good as they are don't get lost in the weeds but also if this ubi comes in or if you do end up using the tracker for the iphone or any, any other app and you end up tracking how much time you're spending on social apps and you end up thinking you know what i need to cut back down on these kind of things you have to have something else to fill that gap or you're just going to end up insanely bored because i remember there was a part in uh, the four hour work week, right? The book by Tim Ferriss, where that's been, um, that's been misrepresented quite a lot, right? People always have this idea that he wants people to um, essentially reach this state of nirvana or bliss where you are just um, eating grapes on a beach somewhere and you're only working four hours a week. What he's basically essentially saying is about optimization, right? It's about like, if you, can, if you only need to work four hours a week, work those four hours, but work them hard, right? So that you have time to do the other things in your life that you love. Uh, play an instrument, um, hang out with your children, go on interesting holidays, travel, volunteer, make stuff. I don't know, whatever it may be, right? So that is essentially, and he says something along the lines of like, I think because he suffered through the same thing where he kind of finally uh, made a muse, which is a kind of a, 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 a business that kind of runs without your input, a business that can only, only requires maybe four hours a week of input from you, right? Something that kind of is generating a passive income business as a general income in the background without you having to do anything, right? And he kind of reached this position where he kind of felt a bit depressed because there was literally nothing for him to do, right? His rent is paid for, he's getting, he's getting money every week, money's coming in from Google AdSense and all these sort of things that he's doing and he has so much free time he doesn't know what to do with it anymore and it's, and it's really... It can fuck up. It can fuck with your brain a bit, right? I guess I guess it would be similar to when you get let go from a job or something, right? It's usually not the pain of getting let go from a job that hurts. It's the fact that you've got all this free time, right? And your mind starts take, playing tricks on you. It starts convincing you that you're a loser. That who would get fired from a job? Oh my god, how shit can you be? Da, 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 da. You start getting into this weird self speak, and you start to really, and you start to you you start to recognize how much time you have, right? free time and it starts to freak you out because you've never had that free time much especially if you're working full time you're working 36 hours a week seven hours a day there is not 
concept of having free time to do a hobby. Everything consists of hanging out with your friends outside of work and getting a beer, but it doesn't consist of like not having stuff to do. So that can be a bit freaky, but I think this kind of uproar is good in one respect. Everyone's kind of speaking about it, but I also sometimes think there is a weird way of like not having any personal accountability in this regard in some respects. Like if, if social media is eating up too much of your time, maybe it's you is to blame and not the actual app itself. So take that with a grain of salt and don't get lost in the weeds a little bit, man. It's, it's just, just an app, you know, don't take it too seriously. Um, yeah, don't you just don't take it too seriously. I'd say in, in that regard, use it for what you can. Like I say, I use it. I put stuff up and just throw it up and just keep it moving. I don't really necessarily even stay on there for that long in social media, but it's quite an interesting article. I think you guys should check it out. Uh, an article by Emma Hope Allard called the dark side of social media, but I'll put it up in the show description so you guys can, uh, view it for yourself. Uh, what else is happening? Oh, this week is interesting week, isn't it? We've got Virgil showing. We've got Kim Jones showing. We've got uh, Hadi Slemen showing at uh, Paris too. Um, it's going to be an interesting week. There's a show studio off uh, of Louis Vuitton panel, which is going to be interesting. I'm going to watch that definitely to see what they say about the whole collection. But like I said previously, I think it's just an interesting time. I think it's just it's just going to be monumental for Virgil and for the streetwear community at large. You know, one of our own graduates um, getting a chance to art direct one of the biggest luxury brands in the world. They're not necessarily known for their fashion in that regard. You know, they're mainly a luggage and accessories company or a levers company. Um, but you know, Louis Vuitton, you can't help but law the name especially after what kim jones done with the company especially after the supreme collaboration they've kind of really come back to the forefront again kim jones is obviously one of the most talented menswear designers out there he's got a chance to really put his imprint on dior which maybe is a better fit for his aesthetic overall um and then you've got hadis lemain who's probably one of the most influential menswear designers of his generation uh someone who probably doesn't get the credit that he deserves um is also going to debut at Celine which is going to be an interesting considering just how much of a DNA, how much of a in-house DNA uh, Phoebe Fire left behind. I'm interested to see how much of that he picks up or how much of it he leaves behind. It's just an interesting time overall, but the Virgil thing is just an interesting conundrum in it really, because Off-White is first, right? I think it's showing, showing Off-White, I think today or tomorrow and then uh, Louis Vuitton's on Thursday. So Off-White is first regardless. The women's stuff usually is always better than the men's Off-White. I just think it just looks a bit weird um, on the body. The fit doesn't it doesn't fit as well as it probably should do. I don't know why personally. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Or oh, someone's calling me here. I'm not going to answer that. Yeah, I don't know why that happens. Um, but I'm interested to see how that, how that goes with him. And I'm also interested to see whether or not there's going to be a little sense of panache or fit or like, you know, uh, if there's going to be a little, if there's going to be some quality control when it comes to your white stuff before the Louis Vuitton thing, or if you're going to see a conti- uh, a theme running through both collections, that's going to be interesting to see. Um, I'm guessing a lot of people will be interested to see what the front row looks like at Louis Vuitton. If it's going to be just like hood as fuck, which would be fucking awesome. Um, yeah, in general, I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be great for everyone involved. I think even if it's shit, I think it'll be great for the generation coming up to see that someone can make a shit collection, someone that they don't necessarily rate can get that job. It also gives them something to aim for. If it's good, it also gives them something to aim for because you'll, you'll be able to know, oh shit, the guy that made the Pyrex hoodie, the Pyrex uh, fucking flannels with just a number print on the back of Ralph Lauren hoodies, uh, flannels are some $500, is also making a runway show. I can do it too, right? So it, it's, everyone wins that respect. Um, I love the idea that he's doing three collections at once, right? Um, men's, women's, I think, no, is it Resort, men's, and then Louis Vuitton, right? All at the same time. Um, that's fucking great. I love that. Uh, I love that he's doing a lot of the sketches for the shoes as well. So there's some you, you, some Instagram story videos I saw on there. I love the fact that he was DJing at Park Life the other day and he's got now a show on Beats 1. I love this kind of whole mishmash, you know? This creative stew. Uh, um, this um, real callback to actual what Renaissance Man is all about, right? Um, varied uh, disciplines, various interests, all kind of feeding back into one creative art form, right? This level of expression and kind of doing it at the highest level possible. And I also think it's good for the critics to see that someone's trying to do it. I think the idea that he's spreading himself too thin is just uh, easy, an, an easy criticism to kind of put out there. But I think you need someone out there. You, I think you need another Karl Lagerfeld, right? Someone that's able to operate on the highest level, doing multiple things at the same time. 
it needs to be shown that that's possible too because there is a little there is too much comfort at the moment nowadays right with just having your one little gig and operating this small functional brand and kind of keeping it really low but let's let's really push it let's really push the envelope and show this next generation that if you want to work hard and if you really want to put your best foot forward there's, there's opportunities out there for you and he's kind of proving it um in, in more ways than one so um you can see what happens and hopefully we get a really good collection from virgil at louis vuitton we get a good one at off-white we get an interesting take on menswear at Celine, which is gonna be fucking great i can't wait to see what that looks like especially the blouses because fucking phoebe fellows blouses were so great loads of guys wore them you know because you saw kind of wearing a few um rihanna stylist i think who's got a, a profile up on is it style like you or the coverture there's a rihanna stylist or rihanna's kind of art director or something this guy he wears a lot of uh celine shirts as well from phoebe philo's uh women's ready to wear that have always been great so i'm interested to see maybe what heidi does with that heidi's always good with shoes right he invented a wyatt boot for saint laurent and the teddy jacket for saint laurent so maybe interesting to see what kind of boots and shoes he does for celine because um phoebe philo had a tendency to always take like um current silhouettes like the air force one and update them or other chunky sneakers and update them and she did really good heels as well i, I, I love the kind of uh kitten heels that she did as well so maybe it's interesting we'll see what he does there um dior homer's interesting um, opportunity for kim jones i wasn't really a fan of what chris van ash did there actually based in my opinion it was a bit derivative um a little bit plain a little bit boring a little bit luxury cause in my opinion or maybe cause was more um budget um Dior, but I don't know. It's just what it is. Does there? Interesting. What kind of ambassadors? Also, see what maybe ambassadors they use for each brand. That might be more interesting, right? Will uh, Heidi Semain continue using bands, um, indie bands for the most part, LA-based bands for uh, Celine? Uh, we'll wait and see. Will uh, Kim Jones uh, carry on using people like uh, ASAP Rocky for Dior? We'll get to see. What who Louis Vuitton use? Will I don't know, someone like Ian Connor walk for Louis Vuitton or something like that. Will he get bloody old to do the styling as well for that too? Interesting to see where he, where he goes with it in general. Um, so yeah, interesting time coming up in Paris Fashion Week. The blacks are taking over. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see where it goes, man, from there on. But I guess that probably is a good place to end it because I've got to get ready for the day's activities. This has been the Agus News English Show episode number 77. As ever, thank you once again for watching, for listening. Um, please so like and subscribe. The link at the bottom of the description of the YouTube and of the audio version of this podcast. Uh, share it with your friends. Let them know that I'm about, I'm about, I'm about. Sometimes I wear glasses indoors, you know, just to keep it funky and shit. Um, I'll be seeing you again later on this week uh, for another episode of the Excellent Zinger Show because I like to put out two a week because I'm a bad boy like that. This has been episode number 77. I'll be DJing at Hivco and Star on saturday you can check for listings and all the other shit on my website xnozingo.com and all the other bullshit i do is going to be up on there too i'll see you guys again very soon thank you once again for hanging out with moi peace